The other operatives were crowded about, jostling her as they all waited for the bell. And still, when it rang, she jumped. It was so loud, so like an alarm clanging danger. She tried to turn against the tide, to get away while there was still time, but she was caught in the chattering, laughing trap of factory girls, pushing themselves forward into the new day. She gave up and allowed the press of bodies around her to propel her to the enclosed staircase and up the four flights to the weaving room. Bridget wasn't at her looms. Mr. Marsden wasn't on his high stool. Her execution was delayed. She felt relief, which was immediately swallowed up in anxiety. She needed it all to be over. One of the girls from the acre approached her. Bridget says to tell you she's feeling a wee bit poorly this morning. You are not to worry. The little coward. She's going to let me face it all alone, eh? When I was the one risked all to help her? The girl glanced back over her shoulder and around the room. She bent her face close to Liddy's neck and whispered, The truth be told, she got word not to report this morning, but she had no wish to alarm you. Now Liddy was truly alarmed, without even the slight armor that resentment might provide. Would they, then, be punishing Bridget instead of her? What sin had Bridget committed? What rule had she ever trespassed? And she, with a sickly mother and nearly a dozen brothers and sisters to care for. Mr. Marsden had come in. Liddy kept her eyes carefully on her looms. The room shook and shuddered into life. Liddy and the Irish girl beyond kept Bridget's looms going between them as best they could. She was almost busy enough to suppress her fears. And then a young man, the agent's clerk in his neat suit and cravat, appeared at her side and asked her to come with him to the agent's office. The time had come at last. She shut down her own looms and one of Bridget's and followed the clerk down the stairs and out across the yard to the low building that housed the counting room and the offices.